right, I want to um, first thank um, Tom and Dominic and Matt for putting together this conference. It's a really exciting lineup, and I'm looking forward to um, hearing many of your papers today. Um, I've been toiling away on the subject of immigrants, new immigrants in uh, uh, Greater Boston, a history of uh, the new immigration uh, to this metropolitan area. And um, in looking at this 50-year history, uh, I very quickly became obvious um, what an incredible time of change it was in uh, the history of metropolitan areas and their restructuring. And um, I quickly realized that I couldn't tell this story without um, examining the suburbs. By the 1990s, in fact, there were more um, immigrants living in Boston suburbs than in the city itself, largely as a result of pressures brought by urban, revival, uh, urban renewal, um, by um, uh, uh, gentrification, rising housing prices in Boston, which have been some of the steepest in the country. Um, and then, of course, once immigrants have uh, developed beachheads in the suburbs, um, there have uh, the, the role of family and kin connections becomes important, and also some immigrants' groups' preferences for life in uh, smaller towns and cities. So I wanted to just start by showing you um, a couple of maps that illustrates uh, this shift to the suburbs over time. Um, this is. Uh, looking at census districts um, in 1970 in Greater Boston. And you can see that, um, first of all, the, the first thing I want to point out is that in 1970, when you're looking at the foreign born, you're, a lot of what you're seeing here are older European immigrants who are um, you know, living, through, uh, living throughout the area. Um, but uh, the new immigration is uh, in, in the heaviest immigrant areas here, where, which is the dark brown, are concentrated almost entirely in the cities of Boston and Cambridge. Um, you fast forward 30 years to the year 2000, and it's quite a different picture. Um, immigrants have, have now moved out to um, areas uh, well to the north and the south of the city, They've even moved uh, considerably uh, west of the city, and uh, lower numbers in the 10 to 30 percent range, uh, really throughout the metropolitan area. So, and I apologize for not having 2010 data. Um, our GIS guy was really backed up, so <laughs> I, can tell you that, uh, <laughs> I can tell you that the 2010 data shows even more uh, diffusion of immigrants uh, than what you see here. Now, one of the obvious trends that's been much spoken about in the press is the settlement of highly skilled, highly educated immigrants in some of the area's more affluent um, suburbs. These include inner ring suburbs like Brooklyn and Newton, where I live and work, but also um, in some of the newer um, high-tech suburbs near Route 128, places like Burlington and, and Lexington. Um, many of these uh, new immigrants came initially to attend local universities, of which there's no shortage in the Boston area, and they then took up work in area medical centers, universities, um, high-tech industries, and uh, for the most part, the uh, largest numbers of them have come from Europe, China, and India, but also um, smatterings of different groups uh, across Latin America, the Middle East, and Africa as well. So a lot of attention to that group uh, because it's such an unprecedented phenomenon to have immigrant professional, highly skilled immigrants moving directly uh, to suburbs without even stopping in the cities on the way. Um, but um, one of the, um, there's really a whole variety of different types of suburbs where immigrants have been moving. So we have these um, more uh, traditional, uh, more affluent uh, suburbs, particularly the western suburbs, but we also have older mill towns and inner ring suburbs, um, as well as growing edge cities, uh, places like Framingham, which is that, that dark brown uh, area that's all the way to the west. Um, and in order to make sense of what was bringing immigrants to all these different types of communities, I drew up a list in, early on to try and figure out uh, what was going on. And uh, this, these are uh, immigrant, uh, these are suburbs that have uh, a percentage of foreign born that is higher than the state average within uh, Metro Boston. And there are about 100, 101 suburbs that I'm looking at. And of them, 25 had um, rates of foreign born higher, this is in 2010, uh, higher than the state average. 
Now those that have asterisks next to them are those that have uh, percentages that are higher than the city of Boston itself. So there's at least 10 suburbs that have higher percentages than, um, than Boston itself. And um, uh, the, beyond those, you know, a number of those on this list are the, the kinds of uh, more affluent suburbs I just talked about, but there are also others, mainly um, working class and middle class communities of varying types. These, some of them are older industrial centers, some of them are classic uh, post-war suburban communities. And I think it's worth pointing out here, um, for those of you from uh, the Sun Belt or other parts of the country, that Boston is obviously a very old and geographically small city. It's surrounded by older um, mill towns and industrial communities that um, uh, sprung up in the 19th century. And post-World War II suburban subdivision type communities have grown up really in the interstices of this older um, industrial topography of uh, textile mills and shoemaking plants and other uh, older manufacturing centers. Um, many of the older communities attracted immigrant workers um, as early as the 1840s and 50s. Um, of course, they later saw dramatic declines in their manufacturing economies. And since the 1980s, with the rise of the knowledge economy and a growing immigrant population, some of them have been transformed and revitalized. And it's these communities that I'd like to talk about today. Now, as far as re revitalization is concerned, I think uh, what I'm seeing is a kind of a mixed picture. Many of these communities have benefited from immigration in terms of population and repopulation, certainly, and um, uh, to some extent a revival in their retail sectors. But not all of them have really flourished and uh, in the sense of becoming places that provide real economic growth and opportunities um, for their immigrant residents. Some of the older industrial communities, places like uh, Chelsea and Lynn, the ones I'm going to be talking about today are those in red on the, on the chart. Um, they remain some of the poorest communities in the Commonwealth. They're not places that I would consider revitalized. Um, others, though, I would call, which I call, and, and following on the uh, uh, social scientist Tom Chung's term, one step up communities, um, have experienced a significant renaissance around their foreign born populations whose opportunities for social stability and upward mobility um, are significantly better and whose communities and economies have clearly benefited as a result. So some of the highest immigrant populations um, can be found in the region's older uh, mill towns and industrial cities, places like uh, Lynn and, and Chelsea, Massachusetts, which saw staggering population losses between 1940 and 1980. Um, Chelsea lost 38% of its population during those years. Uh, Lynn lost 20% of its population, and you can find similar patterns in many of the old mill towns, either in Metro Boston or just outside of it. Um, in the 80s and 90s, however, thousands of new immigrants took up residence in older neighborhoods, uh, like the Brickyard in Lynn, or the downtown area in Chelsea, which is pictured here on the right. And you may notice that uh, as this rather unsightly bridge uh, that was built right through the middle of it in the 1950s, that uh, has made revitalization uh, slightly more difficult. Uh, and it's, it's quite a contrast to the sort of leafy suburbs you see here, uh, a street in Lexington, uh, one of the western suburbs uh, west of Cambridge that's become the center of a lot of, where a lot of uh, high tech and highly skilled immigrants are living now. Um, so uh, one, one thing that's worth pointing out with a town like Chelsea is that unlike the older immigrants who settled there, who were predominantly, or well, especially Jewish immigrants, Chelsea was known as, at one point, as the most Jewish city in America, but there were also Irish and Poles and other living there as well. Um, they, they went there for the work. Uh, they went there for the factory jobs that were uh, in abundance. And new immigrants, of course, have not done that, with the exception of uh, early waves of Puerto Rican and Cubans who settled there in the 60s and 70s who were still able to get um, some of the, the, the manufacturing jobs in declining industries who were really wanting their labor uh, because they were able to pay less and uh, kind of ride out the, the, the decline in, many, in manufacturing. Uh, in general now, though, certainly today, most residents, uh, immigrants, commute to uh, low-paid service jobs in adjoining suburbs or in Boston itself. 
and uh, it's, it's, it is rather, it's relatively lower cost of housing, and I say relative because housing, there's no housing in the Boston area that's, that's cheap. Um, and it's aging, uh, supply of aging triple-deckers that's been the primary draw for migrant families. Uh, cheaper housing also attracted refugee agencies back in the 80s and 90s um, who, uh, because of the higher vacancy rates in those communities and those with lower housing costs, resettled um, Southeast Asian, African, and other migrants in those communities uh, at that time, and, and those communities became uh, beachheads for larger immigrant uh, communities. Now, um, these cities like Chelsea and Lynn are part of a growing group of second-tier industrial cities in the Northeast that have become home to poor and working-class um, immigrants who have been priced out of Boston, New York, and other big global cities. And, um, Ken is going to be talking about Patterson and Passaic and Bridgeport, uh, which are also part of this uh, group. Um, now, in some cases, I think this development should not be confused, uh, in, in every case, actually, this development should not be confused with the classic uh, post-war patterns of suburban migration and upward mobility of an earlier generation of immigrants and their children. The larger restructuring in the metropolitan economy means that the new arrivals have a few job prospects uh, near their homes. Uh, they, for the most part, live in depressed communities where economic disinvestment has led to substandard housing, uh, uh, poor schools and services, high crime rates, and other signs of ongoing urban crisis that have been uh, evident in these communities for many years, um, but have, uh, uh, have not shown any major turnaround. Um, this has been especially true um, for Latinos. Uh, since the 1980s, Chelsea and other heavily Latino former mill towns have had some of the lowest uh, median incomes and highest poverty rates in the Commonwealth. They have become, as one scholar has termed it, uh, the tenements of the state, racially isolated reservoirs of lower cost housing where migrants have struggled uh, to build their communities um, amid restructured um, economies. At this point, um, there's, there's little likelihood of upward mobility for uh, many of the migrants there or for social integration. Uh, it's not what I would consider a very uh, promising kind of revitalized uh, community. Now, on the other hand, there are places um, where one can see dramatic revitalization in the suburbs. And these are in some of the one-step-up communities that um, are more typical working class and lower middle class uh, communities. They're mainly in the inner ring uh, suburbs to the north and the south of the city, um, but also um, in some of the more heterogeneous western suburbs uh, along Route 128 and the Massachusetts Turnpike. Um, what did such communities have in common? Uh, and what attracted migrants to them? To answer this question, uh, I decided to focus on three uh, particularly important immigrant suburbs, uh, Quincy, uh, Framingham, and Malden, which are shown here on the map. <coughs> Quincy is just uh, to the south of Boston, uh, along uh, the South Shore. Uh, Malden uh, is part of a, a group of um, uh, early 20th century industrial communities uh, to the north of the city, along the Mystic River. Um, and then uh, Framingham is uh, 12 miles west of the city, well outside the, uh, the Route 128, I-95 uh, uh, beltway, and uh, has really developed into a classic edge city of, of retail and, and services. Um, all of these communities, all three of these communities, uh, like many of the others I've, I looked at, have a long history of industrial activity that attracted earlier waves of European immigrants, Irish, French Canadians, Italians, Jews, Portuguese, and others. Uh, Quincy had um, a very active uh, a granite quarrying industry uh, going back to the early uh, 19th century, and in fact one of the earliest railroads built uh, between the South Shore and, and Boston was the granite railroad that was used to uh, haul granite into the city for the building of the Bunker Hill Monument and later for many of the um, uh, monumental buildings in downtown Boston. So the, the, the granite industry was very important there, attracted a lot of immigrant stone cutters and laborers um, that really built uh, Quincy's early um, economy. It's known also for as the home of several presidents, but I'm not <laughs> focusing on that today. Um, the other big industry in Quincy was shipbuilding, and this uh, also goes back 
to the early 19th century uh, because they were uh, actually building ships that could haul granite out of the city. Um, and then later on, with the dredging of the harbor, it became an important um, milit uh, naval uh, shipbuilding area. Uh, World War I, World War II attracted thousands of uh, shipyard workers, and Bethlehem Steel owned the shipyards there. And it continued to be an important um, ship uh, uh, building and, and maintenance center um, into the 1970s. They were still building uh, LNG uh, tankers and uh, aircraft carriers, and a number of different kinds of uh, uh, craft there, but uh, like the the, uh, the the granite quarries, all of this shut down in the mid to late uh, 20th century, and uh, so the, a, a lot of what brought the original immigrants there, those industries um, began to disappear. Framingham, likewise, uh, an important industrial center, uh, originally uh, attracting uh, uh, woolens and carpet making uh, mills, like the one. Uh, on this, um, it's located on the Sudbury River, so this goes back to the 1840s. Um, in the early 20th century, uh, Framingham uh, profited by uh, uh, ending up with a lot of the, uh, some of the bigger businesses, industries that moved out of Boston, particularly out of Roxbury, out to Framingham, the Denison Paper Company, for instance, uh, the Roxbury Carpet Company. So a, lot, a sort of second wave of uh, industrialization coming in the early 20th century. And then uh, in the 1940s, here on the right, uh, General Motors built an assembly plant uh, in Framingham, which employed more than 3,500 workers. That remained open um, until the 1980s. Um, and virtually all of these industries um, are, are gone now or have been replaced with other things. Uh, the, the GM uh, plant is now a, a car auction center. So that's why it has that other name on, on the building. Walden was a town that was dominated um, by one industry, like many uh, of those in the north of the city, the shoemaking industry was really big there. And as you can see from the writing on the top, it was the Converse, the Converse Rubber Shoe Company that was the number one employer in Malden. And after the development of the, the Chuck Taylor uh, Converse All-Star Shoe uh, became an even, uh, even more profitable company. Uh, but Converse was not the only uh, business there. The city also produced chemicals, knitted goods, candy, many of the, the types of products very common in, in, uh, commonly produced in, in the Boston area. All of these towns attracted a large immigrant workforce that built ethnic communities, parishes, synagogues, and other organizations. Later, though, um, these families gradually moved out as plants closed in the post-war era. Their downtowns deteriorated and the tax base eroded. Since the 1980s, however, older ethnic populations have been replaced by newer immigrant groups who have settled in many of the same areas, in the same housing, um, taken over some of the older immigrant churches and cultural institutions, just as they did in uh, Chelsea and Lynn. But unlike um, other industrial towns, all three of these communities moved very aggressively to reinvent themselves in the late 20th century. Uh, Quincy and Walden uh, became stops on the extended uh, MBTA system when the Orange Line uh, was extended um, uh, up to Walden, which became the, term the new terminus for that line. Uh, the Red Line uh, was extended to the south and went through Quincy, which became uh, a major uh, uh, feature of uh, which shaped its development in the coming years and made both towns into important um, commuter suburbs with. Uh, uh, quick access to downtown Boston. Framingham um, became an edge city uh, and uh, retail and services have been uh, particularly important there. In recent years they've atta uh, attracted um, a number of large corporate, corporate headquarters there. But I'd say the biggest uh, uh, anchor of the economy has been the growing uh, retail industry there. They had one of the first shopping centers built there at Shoppers World in the 1950s. And then since then, uh, Framingham and his neighbor Natick um, have developed into the largest uh, retail shopping district in New England. Uh, so lots and lots of uh, service jobs, including many sort of lower paid, low tier jobs, um, which immigrants have, have taken up there. <clears throat> um, unlike um, other, the other thing that distinguishes these, these three towns is that unlike many other suburbs, they had an ample supply of working class housing including thousands of units of subsidized and multifamily units. All three towns took advantage of federal and state funding in the post-war period to build 
um, public housing developments after World War II, and they continued to build thousands of new affordable multifamily units in the 1960s and 70s, particularly around the new transit stations and along uh, the retail corridor in Framingham. Um, because of their earlier immigrant communities, these towns also had networks of immigrant-friendly churches and ethnic organizations that welcomed uh, new migrants, and in some cases there were linguistic or cultural connections between new groups and old groups, uh, Portuguese and, and Brazilians, for instance, um, that allowed, that enabled this uh, to happen. And I can talk more about that um, a little later if you're interested, but I, in the interest of time, I should move on. Um, over time, each community developed its own ethnic mix. Quincy has a large Chinese and Vietnamese population, including a growing retail sector in North Quincy and, and Wollaston, um, and is sometimes referred to now as Chinatown South, uh, compared to Flushing in New York. Um, by 2000, in fact, Quincy's Asian American population had more than three t was more than three times larger than the Asian American population of Boston's Chinatown, which had been, uh, has been shrinking for a long time because of redevelopment, the role of the Tufts New England Medical Center, and other large institutions which have eaten up land in, in Chinatown, and, and as well as uh, luxury uh, housing development there. Um, Framingham has attracted a large Brazilian population around the old industrial south side. By the early 2000s, um, Framingham had the highest percentage of Brazilian-born residents in the state and many believe in the country as well. Uh, the downtown area has been uh, uh, very clearly revitalized by dozens of Brazilian stores, restaurants, and businesses like the Padaria Brasil bakery that's shown here. Um, that some of that has been lost since 2008 because there has been a lot of return migration and um, a lot of short sales and business losses, but it's, Brazilians clearly still the, the number one group in Framingham. Malden, by contrast, has grown into a diverse polyethnic suburb. It initially attracted uh, mainly Chinese and Vietnamese immigrants and refugees in the 1980s, but it has since grown into a diverse mix of Asian, Haitian, Brazilian, and North African residents. It has now has, and has for the past 10 years or so, had the second largest foreign board population uh, in the state, uh, second only to Chelsea, which is one of its neighbors, and I suspect uh, there are some folks from Chelsea who, uh, anxious to get out, are moving to places like, uh, like Malden. Ironically, it was the post-war depopulation and deindustrialization of these suburbs that made the influx, the immigrant influx, possible as housing stock and commercial properties uh, became more available and more affordable. I argue that such suburbs constitute the new immigrant zone of emergence, uh, where the desires of striving newcomers have meshed very well with the revitalization needs and plans of local communities. But I think we need to be careful not to um, exaggerate the potential for immigrant revitalization of older metro areas, as Joel Millman did in his 1997 book, The Other Americans. And I should point out that Millman is actually from Framingham and had a chapter in Framingham on, in his book. In Greater Boston, some of the biggest immigrant communities have not experienced meaningful revitalization beyond repopul repopulation. They continue to have little local employment, poor schools and services, and higher rates of crime and poverty. By contrast, those communities that were posed for, poised, I should say, for reinvention, and which had the foresight to build adequate affordable housing, uh, to develop mass transit, um, they have been highly popular with new immigrants. And those migrants have, in turn, contributed to uh, uh, the revitalization efforts that have made these communities uh, diverse and exciting places to live. Thank you.